Everybody, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in this world. I am here with a very special guest today. I am here with the head of engineering of Telos, Jesse Shulman. Jesse, how are you today, man? I'm good, Corey. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely, man. I know we've been planning this for uh, quite some time, so I'm finally glad to have you on, man. Um, I know we've been planning this for almost two months, so you know I'm looking forward to having you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. It's been some time. I've been looking forward to it, and the day is here. Absolutely. So, so I just want to ask you first and foremost, before we get into uh, what Telos is, how did you get into cryptocurrency and blockchain tech, and what ideals and principles of this space align with your own perspectives on, let's just say, economic freedom? Sure. Um, so how did I get in this space? So I, I, my background is in like enterprise software. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate to get in early at a big enterprise company and learned a lot. And while I was there, I remember, you know, another developer that I respect a lot talking about Bitcoin when it was like really cheap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't get it. I, you know, didn't do anything about it. And then I remember Ethereum and the ICO and I thought about it because I remembered Bitcoin and kind of missed that early wave that, you know, my coworker didn't. Um, and I didn't do anything at that time. And then around 2017, when the market was starting to heat up, um, I had some money and I invested it. I didn't do do much with the tech. I just threw in some money and I watched all the people in the space were very much focused on, you know, marketing and buzz. And I, I as an engineer, I'm like, well, I, I can go look at GitHub. I can go see if these projects are actually doing what they're saying. And I can see if it looks like a quality, you know, code base or like it's just hype. So I, I got into the tech following the money that I put in. And um, and then I started to really understand what the tech was about, understand really where it fits, uh, started to resonate with some of the misconceptions that a lot of people have about it and, and really see kind of some of the potential. So when I got into it, I basically was, was just trying to invest and, and, you know, make an investment in something that I thought was a new technology that was up and coming. And then I just followed right in the rabbit hole of the technology. And, um, so for me, with with the, the technology and seeing what it could do and then seeing the principles behind it, I, I, I almost came in backwards, not not like based on principles, but based on tech and then realizing like, oh, yeah, I, I don't like the fact that the bank can, you know, control that they have my money and all, all of the things that blockchain can bring to the freedoms that it can bring to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I realized, hey, I, I agree with these things, too. And I and I understand how the technology can do it. So, um, you know, I'm all in. So um, and it was around that time that Telos was first about to get launched. And a lot of the spirit of Telos, you know, the decentralized nature, I, you know, I started to really like that. Um, <clears throat> and the, the work I did in enterprise software, I worked at uh, someplace that built like a platform as a service, so you could build applications on top of the software that I built. So we were always looking for application developers that had an idea that wanted to build an application and go take it to market. And what we built was the platform they could build it on. We gave them all like the, the Lego building blocks that they could use to build a, a web app, you know? Um, so, so blockchain in smart contracts, it's very aligned with that. So for me, it was like, I, I get it. I'd love to continue building platforms and building the, you know, primitive fundamentals that you need to build an application. But do it in this decentralized way where, you know, you own your data, you own your your smart contracts and things like that. So um, that was another alignment for me that like that I liked what blockchain was doing and where it fit and where it enabled people to build on top of it was was a cool thing that, you know, I related to. Absolutely. It must be uh, very refreshing to be able to be an engineer and understand like to be able to actually check if projects are, are putting their are, are actually putting the truth out there about what they're developing. I mean, as an individual who, who's not very well adept in reading GitHub, you know, when you go on Twitter or you go on YouTube or you go on Medium or you go on whatever, uh, Telegram, Discord, and you hear a, a project 
talking about, you know, what it's doing. And then you go on the GitHub and you see no activity or you go on the GitHub and you see activity that's either antithetical to what they're saying or, or it's just completely different. It's, it's, it's a lot easier to gauge the, either the integrity or the transparency or the progress of a project. So that that's definitely an advantage. It's definitely an advantage. So that's awesome. And, and on that topic on, on Puma progress and development, and I, I know that you you are a lead engineer, the lead engineer at Telos. And I've been hearing about Telos from a few community members of mine that 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 you know brought it up to me. And I wanted to ask you, tell us about Telos. What is it and, and why was it created? <clears throat> so Telos um, Telos is a layer one third generation blockchain. So smart contract platform and the the platform runs very quickly, half second block times, high capacity, wow. o- over 10,000 transactions a second. Um, so what Telus is, is really, it's again, that platform that we feel is like one of the best, if not the best platforms upon which to build a decentralized application. Um, so Telus was launched over four years ago. Um, in a decentralized way by there's over a hundred people that all contributed to the launch. Um, it runs the same underlying technology and software like the, that powers it mm-hmm. um, as, as other networks like EOS and WAX um, UX network. There's, there's a bunch of other networks that run that same underlying technology, similar to how Ethereum has the, the Geth client, their go Ethereum client. And then, you know, Binance Smart Chain and all these other networks basically took that client and launched their networks with it. So, um, so the the technology interoperable between them, um, and and so Telus launched using that same technology that that uh, the other networks had used, and and we we did things differently though. We changed our initial distribution because the 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 ICO that funded the software was we wanted to honor the people that invested in that ICO because they paid for the software that was made open source. But there were some really big accounts in there. So we kind of flattened the distribution so that it was a little bit more fair distribution. So we wouldn't have like whales controlling with, you know, with proof of stake or delegated proof of stake. You of have whales that can decide everything. So we, we, we gave everybody a haircut. So people that had a lot of tokens ended up with at max 40,000. Um, mm-hmm. And then we changed some of the voting dynamics that we had seen play out a little bit on other networks that we, we wanted to make some changes. So we changed some some of the voting dynamics to encourage people to vote for more validators and uh, more, more, more fair pay distribution for the validators and a few different things. And we built some uh, additional features like some on-chain governance where you can vote for more than just the validators, you can vote for proposals and really the, that the token holders can then decide the direction of the network. So anything that's that's a significant decision, like tokenomics, uh, different things like that, have to go through on-chain token holder vote. And uh, additionally, g- any governance rules, like you know, we have some rules around the validators um, mm-hmm. to make sure that every validator is an independent entity and not just one person with, you know, the keys to fifteen validators yeah. on their laptop. Then that's not really decentralized. Just because you have a big number doesn't mean you have a big decentralized you know set of entities so um we made a lot of those changes and uh launched you know december i think of 20 uh 2018 um Mm -hmm. maybe it's december 2018 yeah so um it was you know intended to be that decentralized grassroots we didn't do an ico we didn't raise a bunch of money everybody that was there was there out of kind of passion for for what Mm -hmm. we were doing and uh, we all worked to earn some tokens and and hope that they you know had some value and what we did was recognized by people that wanted to you know participate in it. So we want to do things more like Satoshi than um, maybe some of the other more modern ICOs that raised tons of VC and you know kept fifty mm-hmm. percent of the tokens and sold thirty percent to to VCs and you know had that kind of different dynamic. So. Um, that that's basically tell us in a nutshell of, of the spirit of it, and and the word telos is is a the ultimate purpose of a thing. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the logo being an acorn is a, from Aristotle, 
his his quote is that the uh, telos of an acorn is to become an oak tree. So we went kind of with that acorn type uh, icon that we have that you've seen places mm -hmm. like behind me there. No, that's awesome, man. That's very, I, I love the uh, historical context. Um, that's really awesome. As a, as a historian myself, once school to be a history teacher, I like how you brought that up. Um, that's, that's really refreshing. Um, I think it's very important to, to allow for communities to value in regards to the way the network is going. You don't want to, in these, in these layer one platforms, you don't want to alienate a, 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 a token holder or token holders or a community of token holders that want to see change and yet can't do any change, can't, can't facilitate that change at all. So I, I, I like when there's a governance structure within a layer one project that enables those individuals to, that are actively involved in the protocol to be able to facilitate change if they so choose to. And half second block times and 10,000 10, transactions per second are very impressive. That, that, that's, that's much faster than most of the blockchains out there right now. So, so on that topic then, on your, on, in, your, in your opinion, how does Talos revolutionize the pre-existing layer one paradigm in association to EVM blockchains? Sure. So we, so something that I maybe didn't mention earlier, but is is relevant here is when we launched, we uh, the technology that runs the network is all C which is where we get a lot of the speed from, mm -hmm. and the smart contracts are also written in C and they are compiled to, to WebAssembly, to WASM, which is kind of, if you've heard, Ethereum V2 is going to be eWASM. So it's the yes. WebAssembly is really fast and it's very, very much used in blockchain and outside of blockchain as well. So um, that's what our Telos network was. And everybody that was building on Telos, all the apps that we have um, on what we now call native um, are built in, in that, with that technology. And then back in 2021 um there was a, a evm implementation somebody wrote an ethereum virtual machine which can run solidity and is compatible with all of the contracts of erc20 and all the things you know about evm mm -hmm. and that that was a contract that was written in c++ that could run the solidity contract so it's almost like inception where you have a blockchain inside mm -hmm. a blockchain right so um no, that was like an open source bounty project that, um, you know, somebody had put out there, but nobody was really using it. Nobody had deployed it on, on a network. And so we picked that up and we decided, well, we're going to run with this. We're going to deploy the EVM. And so the, the EVM ecosystem and all of the tools that exist, MetaMask and, and Ethers and Web3.js and all everything that exists that works on Ethereum and all the other EVMs that have popped up over the years, um, we can now tap into that. And also the developer community, anybody who's familiar with building on EVMs now can build on us. But with that, we bring all of our decentralization, all of, like you said, the on-chain governance, the community. Mm -hmm. Some would argue that our community is our biggest strength. Although I, I really like our tech. I agree. We have a great community and, and it has to do with giving people the real true feeling of ownership. Um, and, and so bringing the half second block times, 10,000 transactions a second, decentralized nature of things, truly decentralized validator set, uh, all, all of those things, you know, four years without going down, all, all the values we have. And then just adding in the EVM compatibility um, was really a great mesh of the two, two things. And so when we launched the EVM in 2022, um, actually, no, 2021, we got it out, I think, in October, November of 2021. So it's been a, a little bit over a year now that since we launched the EVM um, and we've really seen and, and been happy to, to see that what we were hoping for has proven true. Where now that we have this great tech, great everything, but you have to go learn some new contract language and, and maybe there's not as many tools. Now, all the tools, all the contracts, everything from that EVM ecosystem is now open to us and we've seen a huge amount of influx with applications and and partners and, and developers that really love the tech they love how fast it is we 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 don't do front running um so it's a little different we don't have gas 
fluctuating with high traffic because mm -hmm. it, it you know it's early and and ten thousand transactions a second is I mean you don't really see that no you don't <laughs> um, so no. you don't really get to use that capacity since there's just not enough people in blockchain doing that frequent of transactions so um, we don't we don't charge a higher gas price when things are busy because when things are busy they're still not hitting our capacity. Mm -hmm. And and so you can't front run a transaction with like in DeFi, you know, a sandwich trade where somebody sees that you're going to do a trade that's going to affect the market. They have their transaction go ahead of you and basically kind of cut into your profit. So we gotten rid of that that MEV front running thing and mm -hmm. just given a better experience with Web3 to people that are familiar with Web2 and, you know, clicking and things happening right away as opposed to clicking and waiting you know, five, 10 seconds for the blocks to kind of get filled up and produced. So um, that that that's a, an important distinction that, that we now, and again, we call, we, we now have to distinct, distinguish Telos Native, which is the technology we've had for four years and a lot of applications have built. And we have Telos EVM, which is now the EVM compatible layer, which runs on the same validator set, same infrastructure, but <laughs> Now people can just come with their MetaMask, same address they use on, you know, Ethereum and and use the same apps they're familiar with on Telus EVM, uh, but with better experience. So um, absolutely. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I was, I was going to say that's, you know, the layer one kind of question. You know, it's it's still a layer one, but we have the EVM on top. It's not really a layer two because it's still running on the same network. Um, of course. But, but it's uh, it's it's a, it can be confusing for people too. So um, we we try real hard to make sure people understand. You know, you just bring your MetaMask, sign in, and use it, and uh, and don't, you don't necessarily need to worry about the fact that there's this whole other technology that's that's also there that people use. So absolutely. So 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 I want to ask you this then, because th there's there's a lot of layer ones that 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 are ex that exist right now. Um, there's a lot of ecosystems that have been developed. Um, over the course of, you know, since you said Telos inception around 2018. Um, so there's a lot of these layer ones. And I want to ask you, like, if I if I said to you, like, what what makes Telos stand out? Like, what would you say? How does Telos's features stand out in a crowd as opposed to other layer one blockchains that exist? Well, if it starts with the technology for me, you know, as, as an engineer. Um, so just the, the speed and capacity, um, no downtime. We, we've been up. We don't have situations where the validators coordinate resetting from a historical block. I won't name names, but most people know there's, there's oh, a yeah. network out there that, that, uh, that's gone down quite a few times and had to do that. Um, and, and so, you know, the technology just kind of speaks for itself once people start using it. And, and so there's the technology aspect and, and there's, we've always been being a grassroots, no VC, no ICO network. We build and we built through the bear market that Telus was born in and we continue to, and, uh, you know, we here have had another bear recently. We rode through the great, you know, bull run and, and we did take, we did have some funding that came in through that. So we were able to grow more and hire out a bigger dev team and things like that and professionalized things, which has been great over the past year and a half, two years since we did that. Um, but really getting the name out there and getting people to know about Telos is something that, you know, for the early years, wasn't something that we did. We didn't have the ability to. And so now we're really just starting to get people to try Telos and get their hands on it. So, um, so we stand out when people try it, they like it. It's a matter of getting people to know about it and come, come try it out. And we're really seeing that take off um, in these past few months even. And then, um, but then when you take a step back and you're not looking at the technology, then you start asking yourself questions about the validator set and the decentralized nature of it and the tokenomics of it. And, and when you, when you analyze, maybe there's other projects that have comparable technology that maybe they're not as fast, but they're fast enough because half a second, a second, even two seconds is probably not, it, you know, for a user, they're not going to care too much. Maybe if it's 15 seconds, they are going to notice and complain. Yeah. So, um, so you know, you look at some of these other projects and you say, okay, well, does does a large VC firm have 50% of the token supply? Are they controlling the markets? Is this organic or is it is it propped up and therefore going to collapse when you have 
FTX Alameda type situations happen. Um, you know, those those when they crumble, they bring down everything with them that they were kind of propping mm -hmm. up. And, and with Telos, we're there's nobody that's propped us up to get here so far, right? So when when people ask, you know, well, what if what if you run out of funding or you know, we we started with no funding. So when you start from zero, you're not really afraid to go back to zero, right? Um, mm -hmm. When, when companies start with uh, $100 million in their war chest, when they run out, people are probably not going to be sticking around. Um, they're there for the money and because of the, the funding they received. So um, there's that. And then the validator set, which is truly, truly decentralized. When you look at some of these networks, um, you know, maybe they don't have uh, a huge war chest of money or, or maybe the team didn't keep a huge amount of tokens, but the validator set basically controls the network and if you look behind the curtain, the validators are all that project, right? They don't, you know, they, there's one person or there's one entity with, you know, a few people that can decide that they need more tokens than to just turn on their own faucet, right? That you, and yeah, I'm sure you've seen that in some governance yeah. proposals and different networks where they just, oh, well, we, we, we're out of money. We need more money or, you know, whatever. And they just, they just do what they want because they control the network. So with Telos, we don't have any single individual or even group of individuals that has any effective control over the network. Uh, the validators are truly independent entities. They're not, you know, the same, like I said earlier, the same person, you know, get their laptop, you control, you know, 60% of the validators. We don't have that. Um, and the token distribution, uh, because the token holders decide the validators is, is also very critical in that, in that picture of, the validators are decentralized, the token holders are decentralized, and they're picking from actually decentralized validators. So um, it's it can be difficult at times when you have so many people with opinions and they all are decision makers together, right? So true decentralization sometimes, you know, can can cause inefficiency. Um, so we we try to be as efficient as we can given some you know decentralization constraints that are outside of our control and and in a lot of ways are uh benefits that we have to be so decentralized so um yeah no, it's, it's, it's hard to compare the the two the technology and then but also you know at a certain point if you're if you have no decentralization and you have great technology then why are you a blockchain right why don't no, you just of course i that? agree <laughs> so got to balance those two I agree. I, I believe the balance is very important. I believe that decentralization is very important. I think that over the last year, decentralization lost its way. Um, and I'm hoping that the pendulum swings back because of the re reactionary responses surrounding, you brought up the FTX issue, the amalgam of DeFi and CeFi that occurred over the last year, that got a lot of people's finances ruined as a result of BlockFi, Celsius, the Terra Luna incident, um, FTX, now Genesis Lending happening. So we had this amalgam of DeFi and CeFi. And as a result of that, um, people lost a lot of funds. And it's unfortunate because people forgot the grassroots notion of what decentralization is. So, so th there has to be some sense of function there on, on what understanding what an actual decentralized chain is. And I want to ask you, because you brought up tokenomics, I wanted to ask you about the Telos coin, you brought up govern that, that, that it plays a role in governance. What, what, what other utilities does it have and how is it the engine per se on the Telos blockchain? <coughs> so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. It's okay. So we have uh, the native network that I mentioned <clears throat> and then we have the EVM. <clears throat> the water went down the wrong pipe. Um, it's okay. So the, the native network is a fee-less network, which it has a lot of good use cases for, for that reason, right? Um, things like GameFi and, and different things that need that, you know, really high performance, high capacity network. <clears throat> and where users wouldn't want to do transactions at $5 a pop. Of um, so on the native network, you stake your, your Telos to the network and that gets you some allowance of capacity. So um, an analogy is if you stake one Telos and there's 100 Telos staked, then you kind of, in theory, although it's much more complicated, have 1% of the capacity of the network because you, your account has 1% of the token stake. Um, and that's how the, the fee-less nature of, of 
the native network works. Um, now, on-chain storage we call RAM because in, in, in actuality it's stored in, in the computer's RAM, which gives us that high performance because everything is read and written out of RAM. Um, so that's like on-chain storage. Like if you store an NFT or you, you know, if you're going to have a token, you have to store your balance of that token. So that that's using RAM. You also buy the RAM resource using Telos. So all the resource management on native is done through the Telos token. Mm -hmm. And also when you've staked it, that actually is what's votable. So when you stake, uh, you can, you can either stake for resources or you can stake for rewards. We also have um, pretty, pretty good staking rewards that pay out from the network reserve. Um, and I'll, I'll just pause, say it's not a algorithmic staking thing. It's not an algorithmic Luna type situation. Um, when we launched the network, there was a big reserve of funds that was kind of set aside for the network. Um, cool. And this is another thing that token holders always have to vote on how those are used and what rate of distribution things are at. So one of the many governance proposals we've had voted to turn on staking rewards at a certain rate. Um, so the, the percentage goes up and down, the more people stake, the lower the percentage, the less people stake, the higher the APY, because it's a fixed amount of tokens that come out every every month. Um, so you can stake for resources and, and use the utility of the token to make transactions. Um, and then you can also stake for the staking rewards. Um, and most people stake a small amount for resources because you don't need that much to do your daily transactions and then put the rest into for staking rewards. And then inside our EVM, it's the gas token. So if you're on Ethereum, Ether is the gas token. It's the value that's transferred and, and used to, to spend on gas. Um, so in the EVM, the, the token is the gas token. And you can move the Telos token in and out of the EVM you know, seamlessly in, in one transaction. There's no bridges or anything. It's the same network. Um, so if you're putting some Telos in the EVM, you're going to spend it on gas or use it to buy NFTs or do DeFi stuff inside the EVM. And if you're outside the EVM, you're going to stake it and you're going to be using your, your staked capacity to do transactions. Um, right now, although we've got it kind of on the roadmap, we want to do it. The only place that you can vote is on the native network. So all the voting for validators and stuff, we haven't opened that up yet to the EVM. Um, but inside the EVM, we also have uh, staking rewards. Um, we use the newer ERC4626, like it's a single-sided uh, yield bearing token standard. Um, so we implemented that inside the EVM. So the same APY, for staking rewards is available on both EVM and native. Um, but inside the EVM, the way that 4626 works is you get back kind of a receipt token or a share token. It's called S Telos. So you stake your Telos inside the EVM, you get back S Telos, but that's fully transferable. It's, it, it's uh, something that is actually getting used a lot in DeFi. Um, we've got a, a prediction market where you can kind of predict sports events or different events that you know, they use S Telos instead of Telos, um, which means it's gaining APY every, you know, every day. And um, there's a bunch of DeFi pools with S Telos. So um, inside the EVM, you can't vote with the Telos you stake, but you can get that S Telos token and you can use it. And then outside the EVM, when you stake, it's kind of locked up. You can't use that Telos, but you can vote with it. Um, so that at a high level is the utility of, of the Telos token is, is voting. Um, doing DeFi in the EVM, and of course, covering any cost of transactions um, and, and voting for validators, right? So if you want to be a validator, the more Telos you have that you can, you know, delegate to yourself as a, as a validator, the, the better. So, um, and there's, to be perfectly honest, there's, um, there's a number of apps that are, that are using it, that are actually planning to use it as their, you know, fee token. So they're actually charging in Telos and denominating their, their services and Telos. So there's a bunch of uh, different things that, that it can get used for beyond just the common ones that I've described. No, of course. I mean, utility is very important for a coin. I mean, if you have a coin that doesn't really have utility, I mean, this industry is all based on speculation, but there tends to be less of a speculative aspect when your coin at least does something. At least your coin has multitudes of utility and multitudes of avenue of, of, of value in a network, where as in, in some networks, the, the value of the coin is just based off of subjective speculation. 
at least in, in Telos, you have multiple structures of, of bringing utility, which in turn would be, the, would, would, would understand the notion of value in a lot of ways. So, so I want to ask you this then, and before we do, before I do ask you this question, um, I want to just ask everybody um, to please go in the description, and if you like what you're hearing about Telos, please check out the uh, Telos website. I have the link in the description. I have the Telos Telegram in the description, and I also have the Telos Twitter as well. So make sure to follow all of these links and make sure to, excuse me, to make sure to check out this blockchain if you are interested in what we're talking about. So, so my last question to you, Jesse, is where do you want to see Telos by the end of 2023? Like what, what is the roadmap? What are the developments that should be occurring by the end of 2023 in the Telos ecosystem? By the end of 2023. Wow. You know, that's about five years away in crypto, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. So, um, so the, I, and I, I should give credit because, so when I mentioned we share the same software, underlying software that we launched with, um, with these other networks, um, that was funded by an ICO uh, that Block One did. And they kind of broke their social contract with, with the investors mm -hmm. and they stopped kind of maintaining the software. Um, so for the bulk of 2021, uh, well, for the bulk of 2021 and 2022 really, um, they, gosh, these years, they get mixed up. Yeah. I know. 20, 2021, towards the end, they had not done anything for most of the year. And we and the other networks recognized that we run the software and we need to maintain it. Although it was excellent from day one, you always want to be able to improve. And there were some things that had been promised by the original core development team at Block One that weren't delivered. Um, so we all... All the networks that run the software, which extends beyond the four that I listed, um, we all kind of socialized and said, let's get together and let's take the code. It's open source. Let's rename it, rebrand it, because we weren't getting our hands on the uh, the branding and the IP there, trademarks, um, and let's start maintaining it. So we formed a coalition and we came together last year and established a new name. It's called Antelope IO. Um, and we funded a coalition fund with all the four networks and we established the priorities we have for the common software all we all run um and so through that antelope coalition that the four of us are our four networks the wax network they're big on nfts um ux network which is just starting to get some some traction um and then the eos network which i'm sure a lot of people have heard of because that was the that was the network that whose token was part of that block one ICO. Mm -hmm. um, the four of us got together and formed this coalition and we decided what we wanted out of the base software. Um, and some of the engineers that had originally built it were hired, um, but mostly by the, the ENF, the EOS Network Foundation. Um, but we've, we've through the funding of the Camp Antelope Coalition, we have funded uh, two major initiatives last year that are, that are finally coming to fruition. One of them is IBC. So, Interblockchain communication yep. between all of our networks is something that just got turned on in the last, I want to say maybe a month ago now, a little awesome. over a month ago. So it's all trustless. There's no bridges in between, right? That's where all the billions of dollars get stolen is that that bridge between networks, right? Um, it's all proof based, totally trustless. There is no inter intermediary third party that's verifying your transactions happened on one chain, proving them. It's all cryptographic proofs that prove because it's the same technology, these things can interoperate, right? So inter-blockchain communication is a real big thing that just got deployed and there's some phase two improvements. Um, and another really, really impactful one is um, instant finality, which was also funded oh. through the coalition. Um, both of those actually are being developed by the UX network team and their engineers. Um, so we have a really good relationship with all of our networks and and they've the, the instant finality is gonna bring the finality down basically to like under potentially under a second that's right like, like likely one to two seconds where the, the transactions are actually final which if you're thinking what does that mean like on ethereum you do a deposit and the exchange wants to see 30 confirmations which means mm -hmm. they want to see the block that has your transaction and then 29 more or 30 more 
before they consider it final. And even then it's kind of probabilistic, you know, it's not yes. like statistically final. Nobody's going to reorg the network after 30, we hope, um, but it's not absolute, right? So ours is like absolute cryptographic finality within like a second or two, which is going to, uh, that plays in with the IBC because right now the IBC waits for finality. And so once we get finality down to like, you know, a second, now I want to do IBC. I send a transaction, you know, I, I maybe buy it, buy an NFT on wax, but I want to hold it on Telos and I, I do the transaction one place a second later, I can prove it on the other because it's already final and then it's proven. And, and I did that all myself without a bridge or having to trust the third party. It's just, true inner blockchain communication. So those two things are really big for all of our networks. Um, and and we're, we're all really excited to really kind of realize the potential and have everybody get, get to actually touch and feel like what that technology can do. Cause it's really what it's, I think gonna get us to that next, you know, real big picture widespread adoption is you're gonna need multiple yeah. networks interoperable without bridges going down and everybody losing what was bridged. Um, so, so those two things are real, real big for us. Um, and they also open up the door for, you know, mm -hmm. even though, like I said, 10,000 TPS, you rarely hit that capacity, but mm -hmm. horizontal scalability side chains with a purpose. So maybe you have a, a side chain that's more focused on GameFi. Maybe you have different, different networks, like side chains, like that maybe a privacy focused one or, you know, different purposes that, um, maybe an enterprise one that's not available to the public, but is still interoperable with the public decentralized ledger where you really get your trust, your security and your decentralization. So um, really excited about that stuff, bringing on a lot more apps that we've been talking to um, that are still kind of not announced yet. Um, and and then for, for Telos specifically, what we've been working on, because um, what I shared was really that our base layer improvements are coming and we're excited about those. Um, but with our EVM, we have a, a new version of our RPC that's going to make things faster and easier for node operators to run. Um, we're, we're releasing some indexers. So what a lot of networks have um, are, you know, we're going to try to make public. A lot of networks have, you have to pay to get access to like an NFT API or different APIs that are like really curated data that that's taken out of the, the network and put into the right form. So it's easy to query, like what are my NFTs of, what are, who are the top holders of a token? So we're working to um, release that in the, in the next month or two where it's going to be completely public. And we're trying to keep one thing we've always tried to do is keep things free, at least have have a have a, a base entry freemium type model where the things that apps need to build, they mm -hmm. have available to them uh, without having to go sign up for a service and things like that. So um, we're just really excited about continuing to mature the fundamentals of what what we, we need to offer all the applications that want to build on Telos and, um, and then starting to use some of the new technology, like some ZK things we do have, yep. you know, the, the primitives needed to do zero knowledge proof stuff. So, um, you know, again, we try to focus on enabling apps and partners to build the cool use cases and, and the cool products um, because, you know, we want to lift them up and we're all better together. Um, but we also, once we've gotten through some of these things that we want, those building blocks we want to make available to apps on the network, we really are excited to to decide what maybe we want to build, you know, as the core development team, maybe we want to build a product, maybe we want to build some more tooling that's like not just the, the Lego blocks, but, you know, some real pre-built toolkits to do privacy or or things like that. So um there's there's some there's some kind of greenfield horizon that's in front of us that we're really excited to really get our teeth into once we've delivered our current uh, kind of fundamental things we're working on. No, absolutely no, and I, I appreciate that very thorough response. I think it's very important to understand where exactly a blockchain is going, especially in such a competitive atmosphere within this space and with new narratives and new trends that will probably be on the horizon like every single bull, bull market has had. You've had D5 NFTs, you had Metaverse, you had Layer 1, you had ICOs, you had Layer 2s. So it's definitely, a, um, it's definitely refreshing to hear that a chain has a, a, a roadmap that's prepared to be able to continuously grow and stand out moving forward in this consistently uh, evolutionary space. So, so I want to say I, I really 
really appreciate your time today, Jesse, educating me on Telos. I know we've been planning this dream for quite some time, and uh, I really am looking forward to having you or a representative, uh, another representative of Telos on sometime in the near future as the product grows, because, you know, I'm happy to have anybody on that that's really building and, and, and growing an ecosystem. So I want to say I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that your questions were really uh, kind of sparking the types of things that I love to talk about. So I, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Absolutely, man. I try my best to make the, the questions thought provoking and not your traditional when moon, when Lambo BS. It doesn't help anybody's cause. Yeah. So um <laughs> Yeah, it, it does it does yeah, it doesn't help anybody's cause by that, besides giving people unrealistic hopium and then if it doesn't happen then then who are the, who's who's to blame? It's the people who are not financially irres uh, it's not the people who aren't fiscally irresponsible uh, irresponsible. It's our fault. So, you know, I, I wanna say, you know, I really appreciate your time. Um Thank you for that. Believe in yourself. Corey is well known for the quality of his questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Believe in yourself. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, everyone, I see this to about 20 people in here. Before we end, just please uh, check the description. Check out the Telos website, the Telos Telegram, the Telos Twitter. Um, and please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing to the channel if you haven't yet. And I'm sure I'll have Jesse on in the near future again. So thank you so much for your time today, bud. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely, guys. Be well. Be well.